Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> My name is Mari Asher, and I'm a co-portfolio manager on Westwood Select Equity and Dividend Select Strategies. Today, we wanted to take this opportunity to talk about what's going on in the fixed income market, our outlook, and how we are positioning our portfolios. For that, we have Scott Bernard joining us on the call as well. Scott is a fixed income portfolio manager and has an extensive background covering fixed income securities over the years. So he's a perfect fit for today's conversations. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? Great. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So let's get started um, and let's talk about what happened last year. So I'm sure most of us are aware to 2022 was a terrible year, not just for equities, but also for fixed income securities. In fact, it was the worst year on record for fixed income securities. So can you please help our clients understand what happened there and what caused those declines? Certainly. You know, looking back, it's a little bit hard to believe, but when we were entering 2022, the Fed was still uh, enacting quantitative easing. They were they were just finishing up, so they were still purchasing Treasury securities heading into 2022. They had not even begun to hike rates yet. Now, they quickly reversed course and began a series of rate hikes that started in March of 22, where the Fed funds rate went from zero to 25 basis points. And by the end of the year, they've hiked all the way to four and a half percent at the end of December. Now this had this had implications for various sectors of, of fixed income, namely treasury securities. As the Fed raises the front end of the yield curve by raising the Fed funds rate, this raises primarily the front end, but it also impacts other parts of, of the yield curve. So we had the yield curve rise considerably. The two year was up about three and a half percent. The 10 year, which started the 2022 at one and a half percent, ended the year at almost four percent, just under. The 30 year rose by about 150 basis points. Put, put this all together and the Treasury market returned about negative 13 percent for the year in 2022 as the impact of higher rates hurt the, the market value of existing securities. We also had corporate credit spreads move wider. So credit spreads are the difference in yield that you earn for holding a corporate bond as opposed to a treasury bond. So since corporate bonds have default risk, meaning the company could, could go bankrupt at some point, you earn an excess spread over treasuries, which are known as kind of the, the risk-free rate. This spread widened throughout the year. So corporate bonds were hurt by the rise in treasury yields as well as the rise in credit spreads. And at the end of the year, corporate bonds posted an even worse return. We're down about 15% for the year. So um, a particularly painful year for the fixed income markets. There were very, very few places to hide throughout 2022. Thank you. Um, so super helpful. So if you think about it, the Fed took its this aggressive path because in June of 2022 we had the inflation reading as high as nine and nine point one percent. Obviously, we are seeing because of Fed's action and aggressive path on raising rates, we have seen some ease in inflation. But more importantly, if you look at this week's inflation as well as this morning's uh, <clears throat> producer price index uh, readings. It appears to be stickier and it looks like maybe the inflation is not slowing down as much as it was in the second half of last year. So do you think inflation has peaked and what is your outlook for inflation? Where do you think the inflation will be by year end? <clears throat> yes. You know, there's there's kind of two things that are that are true. I think I think inflation has peaked in the sense that I do not expect we will return to the eight, nine percent type uh, CPI levels that we saw earlier in 2022. But at the same time, it's it's not coming down nearly as quickly as the the market has expected or expected even as recently as a month ago and and you know the Fed would have hoped. So you are correct to say that the the rate of decline has has slowed. We're we're essentially we're reaching a little bit of a plateau. Now um, with the the BLS, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, who puts together the, the CPI data, had a, a, a pretty interesting, to me, revision where they, they do seasonality adjustments. So they try to adjust for different seasonal factors. 
they do come out and adjust these periodically. And with just at the end of last week, they, they came out with some revised figures for all of 2022. That doesn't change the year over year rates, but it does it does now show that we had probably a little bit less inflation in the first half of 2022 and a little bit more inflation in the second half of 2022, which means that at the end of 2022, the run rate or the kind of, if you look at just the last three months and you annualize that change to try to get an, an estimate of where we're headed, that was showing that maybe we were down into the low 3% prior to the revisions. The BLS came out with some revised numbers and when you rerun those and when you look again, now it looks like we were at about four and a quarter percent at the end of December. And with the most most recent data that we just had two days ago, we're now back at about four and a half percent using that run rate three month annualized CPI. So it does appear that we've stalled out some in this four to five percent range and that um, it is likely that the Fed is going to have to do more work, meaning raise rates even further than previously expected because the economy is just simply not slowing down like they ultimately are going to need to see to to get inflation to come back down to their their two percent target. The other the other data point that is that we saw had recently was uh, the jobs report that came out at the very beginning of February. This really did kick off a reassessment within the bond market as far as Fed expectations that then just was accelerated even further with uh, the CPI print that came out just two days ago. So at this point, our expectation is that the Fed will need to raise, will likely do 25 basis points at the next three meetings, which would get us to um, or five and a five and a, the next two meetings would get us to five and a quarter percent. I think they're going to have to go even further. I think that I think the risks now are that they go beyond five and a quarter, maybe five and a half, perhaps even higher if we aren't seeing inflation come down like they would like they would like to see. Th- that makes a lot of sense. And if you think about it, what I worry about is that the equity markets have recovered essentially from the last quarter of la- since the last quarter of 2022, they have started recovering. We have seen some pullback this month. But what I worry about is that maybe equity markets are getting ahead of itself and we might see some more volatility, especially if, you know, if you if we see continued improvement in jobs market or continued strength in jobs market. There's no way that the wage inflation can come down. And if the wage inflation doesn't come down, does the actual CPI numbers come down? And if that doesn't happen, then we'll likely probably be in a higher rate environment for a lot longer period of time than what the market was maybe hoping for when this year started. Do you agree with this thought? I do. I do. I think there is a a little bit of a disconnect going on right now between what the recent market, the recent price action that we've seen in the bond market compared to the recent price action that we've seen in the equity market. You know, as I as I touched on, we've had year end Fed fund expectations, and this is using market pricing that have increased by about 60 to 75 basis points for both year end 2023 and year end 2024, just in just since the beginning of February, since the, the jobs report came out. I would have expected that equities would have reacted more negatively to this news. They they have not, and we have seen a continued resurgence, especially amongst the the you know profitless tech. A lot of the stuff that was really beaten down the worst in 2022 has has continued to perform extremely well throughout 2023. I'm doubtful that this this can continue in the face of bond market pricing like it is. I agree. Um, that makes sense. So let's shift our focus to yield curve. Um, so yield curve has remained inverted, meaning that uh, two-year Treasury yields are much higher than 10-year yields over the last several months. Right now, the difference is more than 0.8%. Historically, if you look at the yield curve in- inversion, it has traditionally been the most important le- leading indicator for an upcoming recession. Uh, Last year, there was a, and even to this day, there's a lot of discussion about the soft lending versus the hard lending. Do you think, what do you think is the likely outcome here? And uh, do you think the Fed will be able to avoid a recession at this point? Um, I think that the yield curve is, I'll, I'll first answer some of the yield curve 
-hmm. questions. So, mm -hmm. yes, the yield curve is is extremely inverted. And you know, if we re look back to beginning of 2022, we had a you know a, a steep yield curve, a positive yield curve, and the two year was below the 10 year. So th this has really really taken hold throughout the last you know 20 or 12 13 months. And I think this is there, there's two reasons for this. I, I think that you know historically the yield curve ha being inverted has been a great predictor of recession. I use predictor in quotes. And, and the reason is that just mechanically, the reason that the, the yield curve becomes inverted is that the market expects that at some point in the future, perhaps the near future, the Fed is going to be forced to, to cut rates. So meaning that over the longer term, the, the Fed funds rate will likely be lower than it is now. And so as as that happens, longer term rates reflect the expectation of where the Fed funds will be, you know, over the next five or 10 years. Now, the Fed has typically cut rates in the past because we've entered a recession. And so that is why it's been such a good predictor of, of a recession. I think we have the yield curve inverted right now for for. There, there could be one of two reasons. One is that we are, we do enter this hard landing scenario recession. The Fed is, you know, and in, uh, unemployment increases significantly. The Fed is then, you know, cutting rates perhaps all the way back down to zero. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't expect that that quickly. But that is certainly one scenario. And but there's another scenario out there where inflation, you know, comes down to maybe two, three percent without a big increase in unemployment. In this scenario, the Fed is likely still going to be cutting rates below where they are now. So almost almost one way or the other, we expect the Fed to ultimately be lower than they are currently. And so the yield curve is reflecting that that outlook. Now, it's certainly still possible that the Fed is able to, to finesse a, a soft landing. But I do fear that with each additional increase from here, it just it does become just a little bit more difficult because if they aren't getting the impact they want in inflation, then they're going to have to keep slowing down the economy. And ultimately, that's going to mean job losses. And that's going to mean, you know, economic damage. And that just makes it that much more difficult for them to, to avoid the, um, you know, the, the soft landing or, or even avoid a recession entirely. Thank you. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that is what I'm thinking, too, is while at, earlier this year, it seemed like uh, and by earlier, I mean, in January, just a month ago, it seemed like a, a you know, a soft, soft landing scenario became more probable. But as we have gotten more economic data, I'm also concerned about, you know, what does Fed need to do? Because their mandate is to bring the inflation down. And the way it's been, it's been stickier than expected. So we they might have to take more aggressive actions from here. Um, OK, so let's shift our focus to our clients who tend to be a lot more tech sensitive since they are ultra high net worth clients. So if you are thinking about within fixed income, if you think about corporates, treasuries, munis, on the tech adjusted basis, what do you, which sector or subsector do you think is the most attractive in this environment? Yeah, definitely. So the primary metrics that I use to to look at this are, you know, the, the overall yield levels. But the but within corporates, I'm primarily looking at the the corporate spreads. And so the the cor corporate bond spreads, as I mentioned, moved wider throughout 2022. They've come back throughout the last half of, of 22 and the, the first part of 2023, you can largely think of them as um, you know, a risk metric. So they they roughly trade similar to what you might see in, in the equity markets. So those have recovered. They are now at about long-term averages, maybe just inside. So corporates remain remain reasonably attractive to me. I think that I think we can we continue to find attractive, you know, investment grade corporate opportunities for clients, you know, anywhere, anywhere out to you know ten years. If, if someone wants to go out that long, given the inversion in the yield curve, you know, perhaps you don't go out that far. But treasuries and corporates are you know look look fairly attractive to me at these yields. Munis, on the other hand, have the the yields there have have stayed much lower than what we've seen in both treasuries and corporates and and I'm and I'm talking on a, a tax equivalent basis. So munis are trading 
below treasuries once you adjust, even after you adjust for the, the tax benefits, meaning that there's really not a lot of benefit at these at these yields to, to owning munis, especially, you know, when you can earn better returns just by owning you know, U.S. treasuries, which are incredibly liquid if you do if you do need to sell. And also, you know, the, the lack of, of credit risk that that while low is still there in munis as well. OK, and that makes sense. So and just to follow up, you know, Earlier this week, six month treasury went over the yield on six month treasury went above five percent. Um, so if you look at it, the individual's instinct would be to, you know, basically park all of their fixed income into a six month treasury uh, bond and then decide it's in six months what to do with it. When do you think it makes sense to have a more uh, bladdered portfolio and then maybe lock in higher rate, slightly lower rates, but at a high for a longer period of time? I Right. Yeah, that that is that is the real trade off and the real kind of question that, that we're looking at right now, because it's perfectly rational to look at the yield curve and 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 pick, you know, the front end. That, that's that's what the Fed is attempting to get people to do, you know, by raising the Fed funds rate. They want to make cash more attractive. They want people to take money out of different parts of the economy and slow those parts of the economy down. And so by by making cash more attractive, that's a, that's effectively how monetary policy you know transitions its way into the economy. Now that said, we, you know if you put everything all your eggs in the six month basket, there will be a time where that six months comes due, and you're forced to reinvest in a lower yielding world. So while I do think that it's quite possible the Fed is going to to have to keep raising rates beyond what's currently priced into the market, I do think it makes sense to start building some sort of of ladder portfolio, you know, perhaps out to you know three to five years. And I'm talking maybe you have bonds that mature every six months, every nine months, something along that along those nature, even shorter if if you prefer. And then, you know, you're diversifying yourself a little bit more. So if in six months yields have continued to go higher, you've you've take that first maturity and you can roll it out into something in a higher yielding environment. If yields have moved lower, then, you know, you're reinvesting that first maturity into a lower environment, but you've locked in the, the other portion of your of your portfolio at the higher yields for longer. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hedged way to go about it. But I think I think it makes sense. You can get, you can earn good cash flow. You know, with the the T bills, as you mentioned, at five percent, you can buy, you know, two year, two years north of four, four and a half percent, even the five years above five, above four percent again. So there's attractive. You know, you can build an attractive portfolio just by by treasuries. If you looked at corporates, you know, you the that spread differential, you can easily build a, an attractive you know, one to five year corporate portfolio, you know, that yields around five percent. And that's fully investment grade. That makes sense. And that's what we are talking to our clients about as well is if they have some excess cash that they know that they'll not need for six months, but might need it in, you know, in nine months, it makes sense to park it in six month treasury bills. That's yes. the best way to go for it. But if you are thinking about long term, we still encourage our clients to have a lettered portfolio and then, you know, and maybe extend the duration, as you mentioned, a little more so that you are locking that higher rate for a longer period of time. Um, so let's shift. Let's go back to the overall economy now. Uh, one thing that we actively monitor here at Westward is uh, the health of credit markets because that generally is the red flashing sign about the overall economy. Last year there were some talks about how maybe we were seeing some tightness in the market, but what do you think is the? How do you think about the health of the credit market right now? Are you seeing lending con conditions same as last year? easing or are they tightening? Right, yes. So um, we do we do closely monitor, you know, credit markets, both for, you know, corporate credit spreads, as, as I've mentioned a few times. We also look at the funding markets very closely because historically funding markets, meaning, you know, money market funds, com commercial paper, repo, different different parts of the market that are used by you know various participants, you typically do see tightness here and issues that that show up here before you see it elsewhere. 
We are not seeing many many signs at all right now in those various market measures that the the market is is concerned from the sense of of funding or any liquidity issues, things of that nature. We did see some of this in the last in the third quarter, particularly around the time when the UK government announced the the uh, the tax cut from the the very short lived uh, Liz Truss. Um, when her short-lived uh, tenure as, as prime minister, that did cause issues in, in the UK funding markets, which then started to spill over some into the US funding markets. But ultimately, the Bank of England stepped in. They did some effectively quantitative easing, buying some UK government bonds, and they were able to um, they were able to stop that issue. And then they ultimately, you know. They didn't go through with uh, with Liz Truss's, um, you know, tax cut, but this didn't this this showed some signs of starting to spill over in the U.S. Something we were certainly monitoring, but it didn't end up causing causing long term issues for for U.S. funding markets. Now we we have seen you know one data point that just recently came out the the Federal Reserve does a a survey of various uh, lending officers at at banks all over the country. And one of the questions they ask them is, are you tightening or are you loosening lending standards? The number of uh, respondents who have are now tightening lending standards for their various clients has has increased fairly significantly, you know, back to levels that we that has typically preceded um, increased defaults in you know the high yield market, which is you know lower quality. Corporate bonds, you know, customers that are a little bit, you know, on the more on the cusp. So th- this is this is potentially a sign of upcoming, you know, issues from the um, from various parts of, of the credit market, but it hasn't doesn't have a hundred percent track record by any means. But it is showing that banks are starting to pull back some as far as um, you know lending activity. That makes sense. So super helpful. So my last question is about something that I think is very important for our clients and a lot of clients ask about this, and it is the ever-growing U.S. debt. Um, Earlier this year, uh, U.S. Treasury basically made it clear that they have till June to raise the ceiling or otherwise the U.S. government might default. What history tells us is that generally there's a lot of discussion, but the debt ceiling eventually gets raised and then people go back to doing their whatever they are doing. So what do you think is the likelihood of a U.S. default this time? And then if that is to happen, what are the consequences? Yeah, so this is a um, this is a topic where it. You know, you're we're talking about something that's a fairly low probability event with with very large uh, repercussions. I think that it is quite likely that you know the gamesmanship within between, especially between the House and the the uh, Biden administration, who are largely those two, those are the two who are going to be negotiating. You know, there will likely be. You know, a lot. They will likely run it down pretty close to the end. You know, the estimate as far as the kind of the the date. Some of that depends on how much tax receipts come in in April. So the the actual date, you know, has been estimated anywhere to perhaps mid August or even as late as September. So that that's a little bit of a moving target. I I do think that ultimately, you know, they do come to some sort of deal. I think um, you know this. This did become a little bit tougher just following McCarthy's election for speakership. One of the one of the the ways that he was able to get the rest of the Republicans on board was to promise a cap on spending to bring 2024 spending back to 2022 levels. This would imply some some cuts for both defense and non-defense. Which then you start running into issues as far as do you cut defense spending? Do you cut non-defense spending? You know where do you cut it? The there's a lot of you know stakeholders who who have have an opinion there, and it does become a difficult conversation. Ultimately, I think they 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 do not allow the U.S. government to default on its debt. The implications of which you know, could be quite large. You know, if we look back to 2011, which was the last time that we really had a big fight over the debt ceiling, the the stocks and bond markets largely treaded water 
throughout the negotiations. And actually, the you know the the deal was reached. I think it was July 31st or maybe August 1st of 2011. And up until then, despite the gamesmanship and the brinksmanship, the markets held up pretty well. But then. S&P downgraded the U.S. government credit rating from AAA to AA plus in early August, and that that kicked off a pretty big sell-off in both equities and credit and and bond markets. So credit spreads widened, equities sold off about ten or fifteen percent. Little maybe bizarrely, uh, U.S. Treasury yields actually fell fairly dramatically. So despite the downgrade, you know, people were still flocking to to uh, fixed income to U.S. government bonds, just given they're their still the perceived safety. Now, that's the big risk is do we, if we do actually default on a U.S. government obligation, does that then increase you know, borrowing costs and, and embed some sort of credit risk in, in U.S. treasuries? That, that's where the, the implications become you know, perhaps quite dire. But um, ultimately, I don't think we have to deal with that, but it is, it is a, a, a scary outcome. I, I I certainly agree with that. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think we will see the ceiling raised, but it will likely cause some near-term volatility. But keeping everything aside, that could actually be a buying opportunity yeah. should the inflation continue to come under control and the outlook for Fed rate hikes become more stable. Um, <clears throat> these are all the questions I had today. Thank you so much, Scott, for your thoughts. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Please feel free to reach out to your advisor if you have any questions. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye and thank you.